Adrian Sh- This week's guest can genuinely say that his doctor prescribed him the Beatles. Since being diagnosed with a chronic medical condition, David Bedford has used researching and writing books about the band as a way of distracting himself from being in pain. His latest challenge was to track down the name of every single drummer who played with the Beatles, and there are more than you might expect. I'm Laura Davis. And I'm Ellen Kerwin. And this is Beatles City. So, Laura, can you tell me a little bit about David's illness and what it is like for him? Yeah, so he was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and actually doctors don't seem to know the cause of this, but what happens is it can make you very exhausted and you can have pain all over your body. So, understandably, that was something that was very hard for him to deal with at the time and continues to be. He had to give up his job and his doctor said to him that you need to find something that you can really focus your attention on so that it can take your mind off the pain. And for him, because he'd been passionate about the Beatles all his life, this was the subject that he wanted to delve into. So he's actually found out quite a lot of interesting things during his research and one of them is about the drummers, is that right? Yeah, so he's managed to track down the name of every single drummer who ever played with the Beatles, whether that was in a a session, a recording session, or whether it was, you know, somebody like Pete Best or obviously Ringo Starr. And he's actually found 23 different people, which was really surprising. But I think the interesting thing about David's research is that he looks at things that people don't necessarily think of. So he really kind of drills down into the stories and doesn't just accept things as fact and he's discovered lots of new things but I don't want to spoil them for you so I'll leave it for you to listen. If you enjoy the podcast and want to help us grow and reach more Beatles fans make sure you rate, review and subscribe to the Beatles City podcast. I'm here with David Bedford, author or co-author of four books about the Beatles. He's also a historical film consult on the 2017 documentary feature Looking for Lennon. And you've got a new book out, 23 Drummers Find the Fourth Beatle. So you've become a bit of an expert in digging out previously unknown things about the band. Yeah, that's been the the fun of it. I I came into it almost by accident or by illness, really. I had to give up work back in 2000, got a condition called fibromyalgia. And my doctor said I had to do something to keep my brain active when the body wasn't working as well. I sort of jokingly say my doctor prescribed the Beatles. That, that was his, his way of, he really encouraged me. He, he was a great GP. And because my, my girls were at Dovedale School where John Lennon and George Harrison were, got interested in helping out as a parent and we started raising some money for the playground. And after an appeal, it was Yoko Ono who actually gave the money to the school. More than was needed. And she's been very, very generous to the school as well. And I thought, a lot of people know Yoko as John Lennon's wife and a lot of Beatles fans don't like her. But I thought, she's done something great here. I'll tell the story. So I ended up writing the story up for a Beatles fanzine and it just sort of went a little bit mad after that. <laughs> what I then wanted to do was to read a book about the Beatles in Liverpool and there wasn't one, so I wrote it. If we go right back to the very beginning, you grew up on the Beatles tour route, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Where Ringo was born in Madryn Street. My house, the back gate of it comes out at the bottom of Madryn Street in the Dingle. So, And at the age of four, I went to St Silas School, which is the school Ringo had attended. I was once asked, was I at school with Ringo? <laughs> and I'm not quite sure if I'm being insulted or he's being complimented, but there was 25 years between us. Go for the compliment. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in the Dingle. I lived around there till I was 24. And then my wife and I, we moved out to an area called Penny Lane, which, again, you may have heard of. So can you remember when you very first heard the Beatles? Ooh, good question. I think the first time I really got into them was when I started playing guitar. And I must be about 10 or 11, something like that. And the first music book I got was The Beatles Complete. So I started to learn the Beatles songs on the guitar. So that's, that's the first time I can consciously remember coming across them. They weren't played in the house. Mum and Dad aren't fans of the Beatles or rock and roll music or anything like that. So had you heard of them before you heard them? If you went to Ringo's school, did, were you aware of him before? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was aware of that because um, I started there when I was at 1969. The Beatles then broke up the next year. It's probably my fault then. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so in the 70s, I was aware of that. But, you know, Liverpool back then wasn't necessarily a happy place for a lot of people. You know, unemployment was bad. Um, so who was particularly bothered about a band who left the city in 1963 and split up in 1970? It wasn't a big priority here in Liverpool. Certainly as I was getting older and got into my teens, playing the guitar, so I was much more aware of where I was living and the impact or some of the impact that the Beatles had on the city. So how did you go about researching your first book? Um, because I was looking for a book on the Beatles in Liverpool and there wasn't one, I thought, something to keep myself busy. I'll go and photograph a few places around Liverpool connected with the Beatles. I started with a book by Bill Harry 
John Lennon encyclopedia. And I went through that and suddenly realised there was all these places, particularly around where I was then, living around the Penny Lane area, connected with the Beatles. So I started with that book, then I got a couple more books and realised what they were writing about Liverpool contradicted each other. So I thought, okay, so which one's right? So simple things like an address of somewhere could be given. I thought, well, that's definitely not right. In a way, it became my therapy, my my little obsession of of something to do because I'd worked all my life and then at 35, you just come to a halt. And I thought, I want to know more. So I started writing for the London Beatles fan club magazine. So I thought I'll do more research on articles there. And what did they think of having someone actually from Liverpool doing it? Well, that was the key thing because I said to them, is there anybody in Liverpool covering events or anything like that? And they said, no. So I said, well, I'll do it then. So, so that worked, worked really, really well. So I, I just became known as Our Man in Liddypool, <laughs> um, which is the, the title of the first book. So I just became sort of obsessed with finding out what exactly was true, what wasn't. It's the historian in me, I suppose, and other parts is almost like part detective. Yeah. You start following the evidence. And I was realising that you know, there's hundreds of thousands of these Beatles books. Most of them tell the same stories about the Beatles as, as kids in Liverpool. And they repeat the same stories. Well, if you don't get the first one right, which a lot of them didn't, then they're repeating all the wrong. So they're using the original thing as a source material rather yeah. than going to the... Yeah. Exactly. And one thing I found out quite early was the most unreliable eyewitnesses in Beatles history are the Beatles themselves <laughs> because they were, they were doing it themselves. They weren't taking note of what they were doing and where they, they were playing and all that kind of stuff. So I started then interviewing people connected with the Beatles and that sort of started in was it 2004 and I approached Rod Davis and the quarry men to come and play at Dovedale School to do a fundraiser. So I got to know them, and I started interviewing them, getting the stories. More people connected with the Beatles who were still around in Liverpool on the Mersey Beach scene. I thought, well, I'll just go and talk to them. So what I wanted to do as much as possible was talk to the people who were there at the time and get their stories. And that sort of just became the plan for the book that became Liddypool, which was what were the key events in Liverpool? Who can I get to tell me that story? and then go and interview them and see if I can corroborate what they were saying. So why do you think there wasn't a book on the Beatles in Liverpool at that point? Obviously, they knew that I was going to come along. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know. It, it seems crazy to me because it's the city where they're from. So it seemed logical that there would be a book. Yeah, I was talking to the guys at the Cavern the other week and they were saying that they didn't used to really get people from Liverpool going to the Cavern. They weren't interested, but they're finding now that a lot more local people are going along. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a funny thing. Maybe because when the Beatles became really famous, most of the time it was in London, around the world. They're almost appreciated more, certainly outside of Great Britain. You know, I, I now travel to America a couple of times every year, give talks at Beatles conventions and things like that. And they seem to be more passionate than we are over here. And I, I think timing has something to do with it as well. You know, the rough times in the 70s and the 80s in Liverpool, the Beatles weren't a, a massive attraction for local people because there were far more important things going on. But of course, everything changed when John Lennon was murdered at the end of 1980 because fans of John and of the Beatles then wanted to come to Liverpool and see where he was born, where he grew up, where he went to school, and there was nothing. And so we have to give a massive credit to the guys from the cavern. You know, what Bill Heckle and Dave Jones did, we started the Magical Mystery Tour. We're trying to get a Beatles tourist industry off the ground with no help, full credit to them. They sort of started getting things organised for Beatles fans to visit Liverpool. I think that's when everything changed. It's just it's sad it had to follow, you know, a tragic event. So when you were growing up in Dingle, you didn't have tourists or Beatles fans popping up by your school gates or anything? Oh, no, no. Don't remember anything like that. Over the years, I've spoken to maybe a handful of people who had decided to come here, find their own maps and make their own route. And so they they came here in the 70s, um, a couple in the early 80s, and just do-it-yourself tour. But there was nothing organised, really until the Magical Mystery Tour came along. I mean, the thing that I find really interesting is that you are able to uncover things that we, we haven't known in the past, which you would think with the most famous band in the world, this just wouldn't be possible. Is it because people don't look into them and you shy? What, what would you say? Yeah, quite probably. You have to have an obsessive, investigative mind like mine, which I'm passionate about finding the truth and getting history as accurate as we can. And there's so many different opinions out there. And I think the advantage is, because I'm in Liverpool, I've got access to so many of the people. And of course, the, the great records we got, our records archive is absolutely fabulous. Just for simple things like, like finding an address, locating people like that. But because I'm here, it means I can go and talk to them. And then if necessary, follow up. It's not like so many other authors who will 
either fly into the country or there'll be someone else that'll come up here, spend a bit of time talking to people and then go away again. I've, I've still got access to all those people. So that's how I can follow the evidence. One of the big things with the latest book, uh, The Finding the Fourth Beetle, one of the things that really from the beginning, I've always been obsessed with is finding out how the Beatles went from getting rid of Pete Best to getting Ringo Starr on board. Yeah. It's funny that in all the Beatles history, we're pretty clear on just about everything apart from those couple of months in the summer of 1962. Partly, I think, is a deliberate thing. If you stick a dozen stories out there, it makes it confusing. Mm. So it's like trying to knit with spaghetti. Who's biased? Who wants the story to look right? So I ended up interviewing Brian Epstein's lawyer, who was still in Liverpool. And we were just having this chat, and he was explaining about the contracts and things like that. And we got onto the subject of, of Pete Best. And I was saying, no, so what really happened? Because I knew he was giving Brian advice at the time. And he said to me, well, of course, Pete couldn't be sacked. Okay. So, uh, right. So... Since 1962, we've been told Pete was sacked. He said, well, he couldn't be sacked because to be sacked, you've got to be employed. And he wasn't employed by anybody. Okay. So we've been looking at this the wrong way around because the story has gone that John Paul and George decided to get rid of Pete. So they sent Brian to sack him. Yeah. Brian had the meeting with Pete. He was sacked and off he went. But Brian could not sack Pete because Brian didn't employ him. In fact, John Paul, George and Pete employed Brian as their manager. Okay, fair enough. So... It puts a completely different spin on it. So there's no way he could have been sacked. Okay, and with that. So then we had to work out what had gone on. One of the things I did uncover, I spoke to another lawyer, and he'd set up a partnership agreement between John Paul, George and Pete at the end of 1961. Right. So they were a legal partnership. The only way to get rid of Pete was to dissolve the partnership, which they didn't do. So what happened? They convinced Brian to say the right words, which at no point did they ever tell Pete he was sacked. He said to him, "Um, the boys want you out i.e. your partners want to get rid of you, and Ringo is joining on Saturday. And he had to word it right so that Pete would think he was being sacked. So have you spoken to Pete Best about it? Uh, not yet. I've, I've spoken to his brother Rogue. He totally gets it. He said, now that makes sense. And I said, well, because if Pete had said in that meeting, very interesting, Brian, but I'm going to speak to my lawyer, they would have had a problem. Yeah. Because Pete was a 21-year-old lad, obviously with no legal background, and you're meant to think that you're being sacked. Anybody in his position would have uh, assumed that. But then Pete got bad legal advice because he, he got a lawyer to try and sue Brian for wrongful dismissal. But he hadn't been dismissed. Exactly. So Brian's <laughs> lawyer could just send it straight back saying, my client doesn't employ yours, and kept sending it back. He should have been suing John, Paul and George for yeah. breach of the partnership. That's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I get into. <laughs> you found some more information as well, didn't you, about actually why they wanted to sack him? Yeah, well, the, this has been the big thing. And sometimes if I'm in very mischievous mood, which I'm very occasionally every day, I'll go onto Facebook and I'll just mention something about Pete Best being sacked. The internet goes ballistic. <laughs> you have all these opinions on why he was sacked. And, you know, oh, it's because he had the wrong hairdo. He never used to hang out with them. The others were jealous of him getting all the girls up. And they've got all these excuses going on. But the evidence, and I want to go with, with evidence only, only shows that it was after the audition the Beatles did with George Martin in June 62. George Martin spoke to Brian after the session and said, um, don't mind what you do with them as a band, but I'm going to use a session drummer on the record. Okay. Now, that was an industry standard back then, but Brian didn't know that. He had no musical knowledge, no experience of working with a studio. So he's obviously then gone to John, Paul and George and said, George Martin doesn't think Pete's good enough to play on the record. Right, OK. And they think, and you can't blame them for thinking this either. You know, this was their very last chance of getting a record deal. And the producer they've auditioned for doesn't think their drummer's good enough. Real X Factor moment, isn't it? It is. It is. It's one of those. And Paul rightly said, you know, at the time, we think, can we do this? But we thought, this is our last chance. We've got no option. If we get the record deal, they don't think Pete's good enough. We've got to get a new drummer in. Now, that shows, because the first drummer was asked right after the record contract came through to Brian. And Ringo wasn't the first to be asked. Right. Three other drummers were asked, but Ringo was the one who said yes. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so you found 23 drummers. Yeah. <laughs> that's going right from Colin Hanton, is yep. it right, in the Quarrymen? Yeah, all the way through to 1970. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I put the challenge out to people and said, how many can you name? Decent Beatles fans, you know, they'll get and say, well, they can get to half a dozen. The geeky ones like me, they'll head up maybe 10 or 12. If they're very, very clever... Then they, they bought my second book, The Fab 104. Oh, yeah. Because I list 12 drummers in there. And that's how this, this book came about, was because 
I highlighted the 12 drummers in that book. Uh, my friend Gary Popper saw that and he said, no one's ever highlighted about the drummers. We should do a book about the drummers. So just to go back, the Fab 104 was everybody that you could find connected in some way. Yeah, they had a musical influence on the Beatles. So all the musicians who played in the group with them uh, from the first lineup of the Quarrymen right through to only to the end of 1962. Any other bands they played in, musicians they backed on stage. And then I went back the other way and tried to find the people who taught them how to play as well. So there's lots of people in there who've never been mentioned before, don't appear in any other book. I remember reading it at the time and you, you found people that had been talked about, but nobody really knew who they were. Yeah, yeah. And the important one was a guy known as George Lee, and he was at a quarry bank. Now, all the guys from the quarry men said, this guy George Lee suggested starting the group, but right. was never in it. And nobody knows where he is. But George Lee, his actually his name is Jeff Lee. His nickname was George. And this only works in Liverpool. Because of his surname being Lee and George Henry Lee. Which is a, used to be a department store. Exactly. I really, really have to explain that outside of Liverpool. So he was nicknamed George, even though his name was Jeff. Who nicknamed him? We're not clear whether it's friends or teachers. We're not sure. But Lennon could have called him. Well, he, he did. Yeah. Because one day Lennon went down to his house, knocked on the door, and uh, Jeff's mum answered. And John said, is George there? And she said, there's nobody called George living here. And off <laughs> he went again. <laughs> so, so everybody just knew him as, as George Lee. Well, Jeff's son had read Liddypool and he got in touch with me and said, that's my dad. Oh, OK. And so he put me in touch and had a, a lovely chat with him. And he was John's friend at school. And he would said, you know, you're always singing stuff. Why don't you start a skiffle group? So he was the guy who started everything off. And Jeff lent uh, John his guitar. So again, I then had to go searching. Does John ever mention this other guitar? And I found the quote. He said, the first guitar I learned to play on, I borrowed from a mate at school. So Jeff Lee was the guy. In a way, he started everything. So he's now got reunited with the rest of the quarry men as well, which is nice. And that's what I like to do is everybody who plays a part should be given credit. So I try and find that all the people in the story, the important ones are John Paul, George and Ringo. All these other people played a significant part. They deserve their bit of credit. Well, I guess what's made it such an enormous story across the world is all of those people, but also all the fans as well. Yeah. It just goes beyond the band itself. It does. And I think now we're looking back, it's more than just music history. We're looking at social history, cultural history, because they changed everything. You know, before them, I've done a thing for the new book. We looked at the charts and the charts are full of either solo male singers or solo female singers or some country groups or choirs. But there were no real guitar bands who were writing their own material. And suddenly you've got the Beatles coming here recording their own songs and performing their own songs and it sort of opened the floodgates then for other bands. So they started the revolution doing that. But as we know, they had an effect on politics, uh, the culture of the time. Everybody wants their opinion on every topic, again, which, which had never happened before. And of course, they didn't always get a straight answer. Well, they probably weren't equipped for it. Well, they just said what, what they were thinking at the time, which sometimes caused trouble, but most of the time was quite funny. So 23 drummers, Ringo's number 23? No. No? Oh, no, no, no. No, Ringo is... I think he's number 12. Okay. 12 or 13. Right. So they're the 12 that you had in the original. No. Could I? <laughs> <laughs> Explain. <laughs> yeah, because I thought I'd found them all right. until 1962. And then I, f I found a couple more. So yeah, he must come in at about number 15. He's, he's about number 15. Yeah, because I found a couple more who played. And normally these other drummers, they played probably just the once. Right. They have to have played with the, the group as a band or recorded with them, not, not just messing around. And one of the guys that I found, um, as a 16-year-old, he turned up, and it was the night the, the Beatles drummer Tommy Moore had quit. There was an empty set of drums. He volunteered, he got up, he played one song, and he said, I was so terrible, I walked off myself. But he later ended up in um, a Mersey Beat group and recorded at Apple and was produced by George Harrison, and that was Jackie Lomax. Oh, right. He was lead singer with The Undertakers, and he played one song. <laughs> so, so I found a, a couple more pre-62. Then others. Okay, great. From 62. But Ringo is the longest. So what made him stick as a Beatle? That's sort of the essence of the book. He's the fourth Beatle. He, he's the guy who completed it. And I think, and particularly in Liverpool, that, that there's still a bias going back to the capital culture year and stuff. And a lot of people still think he's a lucky guy. He was in the right place at the right time and anybody could have done it. So I thought, well, how can I test that out? Because I'm not a drummer. I'm a guitarist. I can, I can, I'm played with drummers. So I know the difference between a good drummer and a bad drummer. But I couldn't tell you why right. somebody's a good drummer. So what I thought the best thing to do was actually enlist the help of different drummers. So I think we've used um, it's about nine different drummers in total and just got their opinion. So either they're professional drummers who can analyse Ringo's style. I even interviewed a couple of guys who play drums in the Beatles tribute band. So they would have had to have learned... Ringo's parts exactly. as much as yeah. possible. Yeah, so I thought, exactly. speak to them. And once you start talking to drummers who understand Ringo's style, you realise what a great drummer 
He is and was at the time. And loads and loads of modern rock drummers will say, he's the guy we wanted to be like. But I, I needed somebody to explain it. So it, the simple things was that he's naturally left-handed, but plays on a right-handed kit. Now that immediately makes the way you work around your kit different because he's, he naturally leads with his left hand, not his right. So that brings its own unique sound because only a few drummers play like that. And I spoke to one drummer who is a left-handed player, not a right-handed kit to explain that. But he has this thing which people say he plays the song. I thought, okay, how do we quantify it? What exactly does that mean, plays the song? And it's because he's got a great variety of styles and experience in his drumming career before the Beatles and with them. He can tap into different things he'd done in the past. But what he would do is he would play what he felt at that time. For example, one of the drummers was explaining he was trying to learn Ringo's part in in a Beatles song. He said, so you, you get the rhythm, okay. He's set with that one. Then he does this little fill in between a verse and a chorus, for example. He said, so I learned that and I thought, I can do the song. Then you get two thirds of the way through the song and instead of repeating the same fill, he does something different because by then he decided a different sound was right. So he would never do the song the same way twice. So like a, a classically trained musician would follow a manuscript and would do it exactly right. He just did what he felt at the time. So it must be quite hard to learn. You can't learn his part, there isn't. A set part. Exactly, and that's the thing. All you're learning is what he was feeling at that particular moment while he was recording. Yeah, which isn't genuine because it should be what you're feeling, I yeah. suppose. And, and so what he was doing, and that's what all the Beatles were doing, because none of them could read or write music, they went with what they felt, which is totally different to how musicians before were trained. And it's actually it's almost impossible for someone who's classically trained to read and write music and perform it. Very, very difficult to get them to free flow, to jam, to do what they feel. So what you're talking about is more like, it's more like traditional music, folk music. Yeah, they, they, in a way, they're doing that. They're Learned by brand. ear. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the great things that Ringo brought to it was he could listen to the style of song they were either writing and working on or were performing. And he could say, okay. And he, he would just do, do his thing. So there's some great examples of it. And what I did then was to try and fully understand that. I went back and I listened to all the Beatles albums in order by listening for the drumming. And it's a whole new experience. You suddenly realise what Ringo was doing that you don't always notice. And then you get to a song like Strawberry Fields Forever and you listen to the drumming in that. And it's absolutely phenomenal. It is really, really good. So what I wanted to do was to say, Ringo isn't a joke. He's not a clown. He wasn't just lucky. Not just anybody could have done it. Why did John Paul and George go through so many drummers until they found the one that they could work with? And that's all that the purpose of the book is to say, yeah, others came and went and did their bit. But the one they needed to be the recording band to make all those records and to evolve like they did, Ringo's the only one who could have done that. I always analyse everything and I think, OK, how can I compare that to football? <laughs> I compare everything to football. So it, it would be like a football manager buying all of the most expensive players. Doesn't make them a good team. But if you get the right people who can play with each other, you get a brilliant team. And in John Paul, George and Ringo, for musicians in Liverpool, none of them considered any of those four the best at their instrument. But when you put the four of them together, there's nobody could top them as a group yeah. because they learned how to work with each other. And it's one of those things as a musician, when you play with other musicians, if it works, you intuitively know what the others are going to do. That's what they found with Ringo. He could follow them and they could follow him. Mm. And it was just, it gelled. And that's why he, he was the right one. He was the right fit. It's extraordinary that you can go back to that music now, having listened to it for decades, and find something so different in it. Like you, now that you're listening to it, you're hearing it in a whole different way. Oh, it's great. It's a great experience. And just to go and listen for something different, because some of the, the drummers who appear after Ringo has joined was not because Ringo wasn't good enough. Um, they were ones who maybe added bits and bobs, but three of the guys, the Indian drummers who were brought in, for some of those tracks they were doing, um, so the inner light within you, without you, love you too. That's just something that Ringo couldn't have done. You need the authentic feel. So you've got the, these Indian drummers, that was their natural style of playing. So they brought them in to get the rhythm track mm -hmm. right. And he would have been fine with that. And it shows that the Beatles were open to bringing other musicians in to make the song as good as it could be. And that's what, one of the geniuses of, of what Ringo could do. Because then you go back, there's a, a great book come out called Ringo Star and the Beatles Beat by two local guys, Alex Kane and Terry McCusker. They've analysed every single Ringo song. They're both drummers. And they've looked at what he was playing. He said, and what you realise is, it wasn't just drums, it was the percussion as well. So they were taking the sound beyond just the basic drum kit. So you look at, at everything that they were putting into the songs. And it, it, it's a fascinating look at, say, songs we think we know really well. So we tend to think about the, the melody and the, and the lyrics, but we should be thinking about the whole rhythm of them as well. Yeah, and then, then you do that. Then if you want to, you can then pick out and listen for the bass 
lines that Paul's putting in, which again weren't usual. He went with what he felt as opposed to just doing what everybody else was doing, just the standard bass notes. Because he was a guitarist and pianist as well, he could add different melodies in the background on the bass. So again, it's good to go back and to listen to the bass parts and how he then works with Ringo and he deconstructs. And there's a lot, a lot of this is now happening where the songs can be deconstructed down to the different layers and stuff. And it's fascinating to hear how the whole song was put together and the quality of what they were putting together, considering, you know, the basic, it was still magnetic tape back then. Part of the recording career was only on four tracks. So that's the genius of George Martin and his engineers getting such an amazing sound on basic equipment. Yeah. And there's a CD that comes with the book. Um, yes. You know, what I wanted to do was, because there's criticism of both Pete Best and Ringo Starr, depending on, who's criticising them, as well as bringing the, the drummers into the book and getting their opinions. We also want to say, well, see if you agree with them. So, for example, uh, Pete Best has been criticised by some authors for his performance at the Decker audition. So I got three different drummers of different ages to listen to all the songs and give me their feedback. So that's all in the book. Uh, and Pete actually comes out of it very well. Drums really well, isn't it? And of course, they picked up on stuff, stuff I, I never would have picked up on. But then what I wanted to do was have a CD that would go along with it. So the whole of the Decker audition is on one of the CDs. So you can then read what has been said and you can listen to it and see if you agree with the other drummers. So I tried to find as many of the drummers who were featured there to try and find a track that they recorded. So at least you can listen to them and go and analyse and criticise whatever you want to do, depending on what the drummer in the book has written. So what have you gone with? We've got 41 tracks. So there's two CDs and it starts obviously with the Quarrymen and a couple of the guys who played, they recorded with other bands as well. We've compiled all those onto two CDs. And so again, you can have a listen to that and you can see what the other drummers are saying. And it's funny that while doing that, we know there's, there were three versions of Love Me Do made in 1962. Pete Best, Ringo Starr and Andy White, who was the session drummer who played on the second session. So Andy White's version's on the first Beatles album. Ringo's is on the single. When I was looking into Jimmy Nickel, who was the drummer who replaced Ringo for two weeks in I was it, June 64 on the world tour. He'd been working as a session drummer and he'd recorded and released a version of Love Me Do. So it's actually, we've got four versions of Love Me Do by four different Beatles drummers. Wow. <laughs> so again... It, and do they sound different? Yes. And it's funny, that one of the things that Pete Best is criticised for in the first version from June 62, he puts what he called a skip beat, a slightly different drumming rhythm in there. Well, Jimmy Nickel would, would not have ever heard that, but Jimmy Nickel does a similar thing in his version of Love Me Do. So it shows it, it can't work if it was done properly. Brilliant. So what's next for you? What will you be looking into next? I can't say I will be looking into it because I already am. Okay. So <laughs> that's me, I never stop. The Looking for Lennon film is out on DVD. Um, should be October this year. That, and the rights to that have been uh, sold worldwide. And that looks at his early life. Yeah, we, we, we want to, to look just at him pre beatle really. We didn't want it to be a Beatles documentary. We wanted it to be a Lennon documentary. So again, with the people I've met over the years, it was talking to people who genuinely knew John Lennon. And in the course of the research for that, I've looked at all the other documentaries made. Some of them, there's one awful one, and it was on the 30th anniversary of John's death. And it was supposed to be a tribute to, to John. I don't think anybody, any of the celebrities on there, had any connection to John. A couple of them weren't even born when he was killed. It was one of those talking heads. Yeah, I think that, that's not relevant. So what we want to do is, apart from the historians putting everything in context, we wanted the people who were in it to ones who knew John personally. So nobody's assembled a cast like we were able to do for the film. But now we've got the film. I've got to write the book. So, I mean, all the research is done. I've just got to sit down and <laughs> you've got Finding the Fourth Beatle published. I've got to start writing on that one. I've also got interested in Liverpool's role in, in the American Civil War. That's quite a departure. A, a, a big departure. I just sort of became really interested and thought, I fancy doing something non Beatles. And I suddenly realised how extensive Liverpool's links were with the, the Civil War. So that's about three quarters written. So I've been working on bits of that over the last couple of years. So that should be finished soon. Yeah, I'm also about halfway through writing a book on Liverpool's country music scene in the 60s. A lot of people don't realise that Liverpool was known as the Nashville of the North. So while the Mersey beat uh, sound was happening, country music was really big in Liverpool as well. So I've been talking to a guy called Phil Brady, one of Liverpool's biggest country music stars, and just seeing how even bands like the Quarrymen, you know, if you look at the Quarrymen's first business card, uh, the music stars are a country western skiffle rock and roll okay. so they had country roots and the bands just then either went down the rock and roll route or the country route so there's a lot, lot of musical heritage in liverpool so that's keep me busy i'm sure i'll find something else to do as well but <laughs> i'm sure you will <laughs> they'll do for, for me for now i think oh that's brilliant thank you so much for coming in david that was really interesting my pleasure <laughs> 